Father, we come tonight and thank you for this time that you've given us. We thank you for this service and this opportunity to come and to worship together. We ask you, Father, to be with those that were mentioned tonight, those that are sick tonight. We just ask that you touch their bodies. You help them tonight, Father. Father, we ask that you continue to be with us and continue to open our hearts and our minds and our eyes to the needs around us and just help us to focus and to do your will in all things and all areas, Father. We ask that you bless this service tonight, Father, that you um, help us to do and say whatever it is that you've called us to do and say, Father, and just uh, let it be a blessing to one another and just uh, guide us tonight and just uh, bless our offering tonight, Father, and bless those that can give and those that cannot. And we just thank you tonight and praise you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you do 
serve is for Jesus your King. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily as praises who sings? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, 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 wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, 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 wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. came from glory how he gave his life on Calvary to save a rich like me I heard about his groaning of his precious blood atoning and I repented of my sins and won the victory Bless 
in. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to push things just a little bit further tonight than we did last week. Uh, just, uh, just kind of to, I guess, to catch us back up to speed where we were at last week is we looked at um, chapter 5 and um, the subject last week was um, the righteousness of the Pharisees and we talked all about how how God's expectation was for us to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees meaning that instead of looking towards what uh, or looking at what man calls righteous or what we call right we need to be living up to what God's standards are and what God wants us to, to do how God wants us to live how God wants us to act and, and all the things that come along with being considered righteous in God's eyes because the reality is it don't matter what man thinks or what man considers righteous. It's what God is, considers righteous is what's important because a lot of times what we as uh, human beings would consider right and righteous is completely against what God's standard is and it's, uh, it's always going to be kind of subpar to what God's standard is but that's kind of what we looked at and, and when we kind of dug into that a little bit, we looked a lot at how um, the righteousness that the Pharisees were exhibiting was a kind of a self-righteousness, a self-serving, self-saving type of attitude that, that they were kind of exhibiting and it was the same attitude that we see kind of across the board today in our country, in our world and, and how a lot of different people act and how it's all about people lifting themselves up as opposed to lifting God up and exalting God. It's that kind of a all about me type attitude. Attitude that that people carry, and that's uh, and we that's kind of where we left it at, and we didn't cover the rest of chapter five. We just covered that first part of it. But if you look at the at the remainder of chapter five, there Jesus is going to teach them about all kinds of different subjects there throughout the chapter, and he's and just kind of to sum it up, he's trying to teach them a lesson in in things like love, things like humility, things like forgiveness, and and how they're to treat one another, and and. And he, he kind of does it in a lot of different ways. He talks about murder, adultery, um, and he talks about and an eye for an eye is one of the subjects here. Love for your enemy, uh, taking oaths, divorce, all these subjects that, that deal with love and humility and, and how we're to treat others, how we're to, uh, how we're to um, forgive others and all these different things. And, and he does that and he, he's really, he's leading to a point and the point he's leading to is kind of what we're going to talk about tonight in chapter 6 and and I'm going to cover the first 18 verses or the first, kind of the first half of that chapter there and we're not going to go real deep into it because I'll just be honest with you those 18 verses we could spend weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks talking about each one of them and, and uh, you probably don't want me to talk all night long and into the morning and the next day and the day after I'd be afraid somebody fall out a window or something and so and that's in the Bible somewhere just look that up <laughs> But um, but I am going to cover these 18 verses. I'm going to do it fairly quickly. Um, but um, but I'm going to just read you the beginning. I'm going to read three verses to you to kind of set the tone and see where we're going here. But in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, it says this. It says, Be careful not to do, do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. It says, If you do, you will have, have no reward from your Father in heaven. And then skipping down to verse 5, he says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. He says, I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. And then skipping all the way down to verse 16, Jesus says this, When you fast, that's something we'll talk about here in a minute, but you notice he says, he uses the word when. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. He says, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. He says, I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. Pray with me tonight. Father, we come and I thank you and praise you tonight. I thank you for those that have sung for us tonight. And I just ask you to continue to bless in this service. I ask you to continue to be with all those that are sick tonight and just continue to help them touch their bodies tonight, Father. Those that may have a uh, spiritual need or emotional need, Father, I ask you to touch them and relieve their mind tonight. Guide us through this word, Father, and just let it be your word tonight. And open us up to receive what you have. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Well, the first part here, uh, I got nice little subtitles for this one too. I, I thought it was kind of neat how it's kind of broken up. This first one, though, is not very flashy. It's just giving to the needy. 
Because Jesus is going to talk about, and he's going to tell them about um, their giving and how they are to give to the needy and how, and how they're to act. And if you paid attention to those uh, three verses I read there, um, could you see a pattern that Jesus was kind of forming there? What he was trying to tell them. And, and, and that kind of the pattern that I picked up on was he did not want them to act like everybody else. He does not want his disciples or his followers or Christians to act like everybody else, to act like the Pharisees, to act like the world. He wants us to be a little bit different um, than the world. In other words, he does not want us to be hypocrites. He used that word, hypocrites. And uh, and if we think about just that word in itself, it, it, we can get kind of offended by that, can't we? If I stood up here and said, you bunch of hypocrites, you may get a little offended, mightn't you? Especially if you're really not a hypocrite. Now, if you are, you may get offended because you got called out. But, but, um, but that's an offensive word because if somebody calls you a hypocrite, they're basically calling you a liar. They're calling you fake, in other words. They're saying that you, um, you talk out of both sides of your mouth. You're two-faced. You, uh, you say one thing and do the complete opposite. And, and that's how we understand that, and that's how we mean that. But the word hypocrite... It actually means actor or to act like or to play a role, to play a part. So we could say that Hollywood is full of hypocrites. A couple of different ways, couldn't we? But that's what it means. It's to act. It's, a, it's not genuine. It's fake. It's a playing a role, if you will. And, and, and Jesus is telling them, he says, do not be like these Pharisees because they're fake. They're not real. They're not sincere. Everything they do is just for show. And they're just kind of playing that role, if you will. And, and, if, you, and if we want to kind of put it into our terms, we want to bring it up to 2017, um, we could really say that there's a lot of uh, people in the church world that act that way, can't we? Yeah, yeah. I know there's not many of us here tonight, but I see a few heads shaking. No amens on that, but, but there's some heads shaking. But there is. There's a lot of people in the church world that act that way. And, um, and I'll just tell you what I call them are the religious people. These are the ones, they, they know all the rules, they know all the lines, they know all the parts to play, and they do really good about playing those parts. But the problem is they're fake. They're not genuine. That there's no Holy Spirit teaching them, no Holy Spirit guiding them, no Holy Spirit leading them, helping them to understand. They're just basically playing a role so that everybody around them sees them. And, 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 they, and they're playing the role that, that they think that other people want, want to see. And they're playing that role just basically um, to puff themselves up, to make themselves look good, to make themselves look more important than really what they are. Remember what Paul says. He says, don't think too highly of yourself. Don't think more of yourself than you ought to, uh, basically is what he's saying. And, and, uh, and Jesus is pointing out, he says, you don't want to be that way. And we don't. We don't want to be that way. We don't want to act that way because can you see through people who are fake? Yep. And what does Robert say? This is yes, this is no. But you can see through people who are fake. And one of the reasons people get turned off by the church is because they see that there's fakeness going on. That people are not genuine. We don't want to be that way. Again, Jesus says, starting in verse 1, He says, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. He says, If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. He says, So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. He says, I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Now, as I was reading that, don't answer out loud, did somebody pop in your mind? I see a couple of smiles, so that tells me that we, we know people that act that way, don't we? I think everybody knows people that act like that way. And these are the ones I call them, they, uh, uh, the best way I could kind of picture it is to act like little baney roosters uh, clucking around, you know, look, 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 see me, look at me, look at me. You know, it says they announce with trumpets. 
um, in the synagogues and on the streets. For, and it's for the purpose of being honored by men. That's the sole purpose. And what Jesus called them? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. And I'm going to tell you another thing. Another thing that turns off people is, is really some of the worst people for doing this are pastors and church leaders are some of the worst ones about doing this, about strutting around. Look at me. Look what I'm doing. You know, some thing they um and this I don't know I don't this, I don't know where I came up with this word I don't know if I read it heard it but um, I liked it now it's it stuck with me I call it the humble brag they uh, try to think and say all these things that make it appear that they're being humble but the only thing they're doing is bragging on themselves that's all they're doing. And um, some examples that came to my mind is, uh, uh, I'll just be honest with you, it just drives me up the wall. Or when uh, you see somebody, they'll call a special offering. And what they'll do is is they'll say, well, I want to be an example, so I'm going to put my check in. Here's my $100. Where's the offering plates? This ain't, this a, <laughs> I, y'all need to do the same, you know, that kind of thing. Don't do that. Don't do that. If God's called you to put something in the offering plate, just put it in the offering plate and hush and go on. God don't need you up here bragging. God don't need you need, need me or anybody else telling other people what to be given. He don't need me going through and looking at your W-2s or your tax returns or anything like that and sending you a bill every month. Say, you owe this much to the church this month. That's just bragging. We don't need an example. Now, in our more modern days, we have Facebook. Oh, they love the Facebook. Some of the things that you see on Facebook or some of the things that I see that just kind of get under my skin is uh, they'll get on there and it seems like like the Holy Spirit, their church is the only one the Holy Spirit ever shows up at. Every church service, 40 people get saved, 25 get sanctified, and everybody on the street gets healed. Every single one. And then they'll, uh, and then after they do all that bragging, they'll say, Oh, praise God. Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. You're praising yourself. God don't need people to brag on him. God does what God does. God don't need that. One more, one more. This is one, uh, this is my favorite of all of them. Is, um, y'all know when you're, those that do that use the Facebook, you know that you can check in where you're at. Um, for instance, we went bowling and Michelle loves to check us in when we're, when we're doing stuff like that. Uh, that way somebody can break in the house, steal everything. <laughs> nah. <laughs> she used to do that when we went on vacation. I said, don't do that. People break in. <laughs> <laughs> but but the point about that is what what happens is what they'll do is they'll get on there every time they visit somebody, every time they go to the jail, the hospital or somewhere, they got to check in where they're at. Check in. Who really cares? Who really cares? Do God need you to keep a tally of where you've been, what you're doing? When God calls you to do something, just go and do it. He don't need everybody knowing, but what they're doing, they're bragging, showing. They want to make themselves look more important, want to make themselves look busier than what they really are. And, and, and they do these things. And they say, oh, well, I'm just sharing what God's doing. No, you're not. You're sharing what you're doing. Don't do it. God doesn't need that. And what people see is they see when that's fake, and they see when that's not real, when that's not genuine. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. He said, don't be fake about that. And you know, I'll read verses 3 and 4 again. It says, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. He says, Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And, and, and I read that because I get, I get pushback when I tell people that or say something like that to um, some other pastors and things. And I ask them, what do you do that for? And I get pushback. They say, well, Jesus is talking about giving money well 
every time I've ever talked about tithing or I've ever preached about tithing, I've talked about giving your time, your talents, and your treasures. Giving all of yourself to God. Giving him everything, not just money. So, yeah, Jesus is saying when you give to the needy, what are you giving to you? Need? Are you giving your time to help them? Are you giving your talents to do something, build a ramp or whatever it is they need or things like that? Are you giving money? Yeah, we have to have money to run the church. It's a, yeah, we got to have it or we turn the lights out. I mean, it's just the reality of the world we live in. You've got to have money to make things run. But you also have to have people's time and their talent. And then Jesus is talking about all these things. And he's saying when you're doing these things, when you're serving other people, when you're loving other people as God has commanded us to, he says don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Don't be complaining about it the whole time and don't be bragging about it the whole time. If God says do it, just go and do it and, and be blessed because you've done it. Don't worry about the rest of it but and so we, we we need to kind of kind of get that kind of get that in our brains you know i've got romans 12 1 and 2 he says and when he when he tells this he says i urge you brothers um but god's mercy offer your body as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to god he says this is your spiritual act of worship offer yourself ourselves we are the sacrifice we are the offering to god and and, and when i also i thought about cain and abel they didn't give no money they didn't have any money they gave of what they did, of the, the fruit of the ground, the meat and all that. You know, I always, uh, this is how I remember it, I always say, you know, Abel gave his best and Cain gave the rest. Whatever was left over. But they gave of their offering and, and, and it got me thinking about my grandpa. You know, he pastored for, no, 40 some years and, and he told me, he said, uh, you know, a lot of times he pastored in small rural churches kind of out in the country. And, and he, he says a lot of the people, he said, they didn't have money. He said there was a lot of farmers and things. And they didn't have money to pay tithes. He said what they would do, he said, he said they would bring in fruits and vegetables and chickens. And that's, what, and that's what they had, and that's what they paid. And they brought the best that they had. And he says, you know, he was fine with it. It blessed him, and if there was extra, he would give it out to other people and bless them. But he said that's how it was. But he said the people didn't come in carrying their big bushel of, of whatever it was. Like, oh, look what I got. Oh, here it is. They didn't bring in their chickens walking them to the altar. I think he said he even got a pig or two every once in a while. But the point is, they didn't go around bragging about what they were giving, and he didn't go around bragging about what he was doing. And we shouldn't either. We shouldn't either. But we've lost focus in our society, and we think that we should be, we've got to lift ourselves up above everybody else. We have got to be number one. We've got to be above everybody else. And that's wrong. It goes against God's word. And we shouldn't do those things. We shouldn't worry about those things. We should just serve God. You know, and the... So that's the first part. I think I've drummed that one to death. The second one where I, I named this one praying like hypocrites. That's supposed to be a good thing. Praying like the hypocrites. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to what he says in verses 5 through 8. He says that when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. He says, I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask them. Now, today we don't see a lot of people praying out on the street corners. Most prayer takes place in the church. Hopefully in your homes. You know, we'll pray, we'll bless our meals. But really we don't have this public prayer. But what the, the Pharisees did, they loved to get out there. Then this was in the synagogue or in the church or out on the street. And they would stand there praying and praying and being louder and louder. Uh, and I kind of um, picture it kind of like um, just trying to outdo each other, trying to outpray each other. Heaven forbid we do that today. But they were trying to outpray each other. And the, but they were doing it to be seen by men, is what Jesus said. They weren't doing it because they were praising God or they were communicating with God. They were just trying to be seen by all the people around them. 
And we see it going on in churches today. The whole time growing up, uh, there was always one. When they would pray, you knew that if you was tired, you better stand up because you'd be asleep by the time they were done. So they would pray and 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 pray. But they didn't say a thing. Just words. Just empty words. Just trying to be seen by everybody else. They're the ones that the pastor would call on to pray. And see, I was a teenager, and I sat in the back. I got to see everything and everybody. And he'd call on to pray, and they'd jump up. Oh, proud. Even as a teenager, I could see through that. Jesus said, don't do that. You know, and we've got people, too, that they won't pray. And, and what they'll say is, I can't pray as good as so-and-so can. I don't want to. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Because God is not interested in your nice and polished and rehearsed prayers. Prayer is your communication with God. It's you talking with God and communicating with God. So you can pray just as good as anybody else. Some of the best prayers that are ever prayed, there's never a word spoken. It's just communication with God. And I'll tell you, when if I ask you to pray for me, I want you to pray for me. I don't want your polished prayer. I want you to pour out your heart to God on my behalf. And if you ask me to pray for you, I would expect that you would want me to do the same thing. Because that's what prayer is. It's that communication. That's all it is. It's us talking to God on our own behalf, on the behalf of others. And when we pray, that's how we should think about it. And that's how we should do it. And it don't have to be a long, drawn-out prayer with a bunch of these and thous and those and thuses and, and all those words that none of us use. It's just talk to God. That's all it is. And lift things up to God. That's what prayer is. Prayer comes from the heart. It comes from the heart through the mouth. That's all it is. It doesn't start here. It starts here. And Jesus says this. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, how many of us have our prayer closet? And it don't have to be a closet that you cleaned out. But a special place that you have set aside where you can get alone with God. It's just you and God. It could be a closet. It could be an office. It could be a tractor. be anywhere it's that place where you know that that's where you and God can connect because if we don't all have that place then we're in trouble because we can't develop that relationship with God the way that we need to and if you struggle having that place look for it find it establish that place if you ain't got no place at your house, I'll give you a key to this place. If you come up here at night, they'll lock the door because it's kind of spooky. But it's that important. that You have to have a place so that you and God can talk and communicate with one another so that you can develop that relationship with God. If the only time you pray is when you're sitting in the church pew or when you're praying over a meal or, or, or something or... I don't know, just those odd time, random times, then that then the relationship cannot develop. It can't. And then he says, when you pray, do not keep babbling like pagans. Just talking, talk, 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 talk. If you've got something to say to God, say it. God already knows, but it's good to verbalize it and say it. 
But when you're done saying what you've got to say, hush. Be quiet. Be still. Give God a chance to talk. Sometimes we forget about that part. We forget that our communication with God goes both ways. We, we talk, but we're also supposed to listen. And really, we should spend more time listening than we are talking. Because God will tell us some things if we do that. But he says, Do not keep babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. He says, Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Say what you, say what you feel like God has put on your heart to say. And be done with it. And be done with it. And then, we're not going to get into it tonight, but he gives them the Lord's Prayer. He gives them, I call it a framework, really, of things that you need to think about and consider including in your prayer. You don't say these exact words because, again, your prayer comes from your heart. It's not just babbling words or reciting words. If you, you could pray this prayer all day long. If you don't mean it or if it means nothing to you, you're just babbling words. But he says this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. He's given that framework. And then he goes on and he kind of uh, gets a uh, little piece about forgiveness in there. He says, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. He says, but if you do not forgive me in their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Why do you think Jesus put that in there at the end of it? Kind of this portion on prayer. Because if you don't have the capacity to forgive, now it's difficult at times. People have done you wrong, it's hard to forgive. But that inability to forgive puts a barrier between you and God. And you can't effectively communicate with God until that barrier is removed. And if you lack a total capacity for, to forgive, if you can't forgive anybody for anything, now I'm not saying that if you struggle at times because there are people do awful, awful, awful things to other people. And it's hard to forgive sometimes. But if you are not even trying to forgive or not even asking God to help you to forgive, then that's a, a problem that you have. That's a spiritual problem that you have. Because the commandment is love God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and love others as yourself. And that complete lack or inability to forgive is an indication of a lack of love, which indicates that there's a lack of relationship with God. And that's why he says, if you can't forgive, then your sins won't be forgiven. Because you haven't got within you what it takes. Jesus is not in your heart. So, and that doesn't mean that we don't struggle with it. I'll just be completely honest with you. When my mother died, it took everything for years before I could forgive those doctors. I never, I didn't even know who they were. But in my brain, if they worked for UK, they were evil. And I'll be honest with you, for a long time, I had hate. But God had to work that out. And so, we all struggle. But it's when we just quit trying whatsoever is where we get into trouble. So that's why Jesus puts that in there. About forgiveness. And then the last part, fasting. I got here fasting like nobody's business. You know why? Because it ain't nobody's business. This is what Jesus says. This is verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men that they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will be not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, 
The problem here is Jesus did not say, if you fast. He says, when you fast. And I'll be the first one to raise my hand and say, I do not fast like I, like I should. I, I'll be honest with you. It's been a long time since I fasted. I should. And because I can admit that, I can also tell all of you, you should be fasting too. But I also can tell you this, that there ain't nobody else's business that you're fasting. If God has put on your heart to fast, then you fast. But you don't go around and brag, oh, I'm so hungry. Oh, oh, it's awful. That's what they say. That's what they would do. They would... They, they, when their, part of their ritual was they wouldn't anoint themselves, they wouldn't wash their face, they wouldn't clean up when they were fasting, they just looked all so pitiful. And I could picture their shirt all hanging out and looking all droopy, looking rough. Because they wanted everybody to see how righteous they were because they were fasting. Mm-hmm. Jesus says, you got your reward. Now when we fast, he says... Wash your face, take a bath, clean up, put your perfume on. Don't walk around uh, like a zombie. He said, perk up. He said, nobody should even know that you're fasting. Really, the only people that should know that you're fasting are you, God, and whoever it is that's, that's fixing your meals for you. And to be honest with you, that fasting is that sacrificial giving is really what it is to God. And when we're doing any type of sacrificial giving to God, it should be on a need-to-know basis. Ain't nobody need to know unless they have to know. That's between you and the Lord. And so, but we should be doing it. And we ain't. But we should be. He says, do these things in secret. Why do you think he tells us to do these things in secret? Is it to get a reward from God? Not really. It's because when it's done, when nobody's around, nobody's watching, nobody's looking, nobody knows, then you're more than likely being true to God and you're doing it out of a love for God and because you feel like God has compelled you to do it not to be an actor or a hypocrite. That's why he says this. So, just our altar call. I'm just giving Michelle to put on some music back there. And what I'd like you to do, just spend a few minutes praying, reflecting. Are you living up to God's standards? Or do you do things just to be seen or heard? Or does everything you do, is it motivated by God? and what God's called you to do. If y'all just bow your heads and spend some time in prayer, and then when uh, I feel like everybody's done, I'll dismiss and we'll be, we'll be done and we'll go home. Father, we come tonight and I just thank you and praise you for this time that you've given us. I thank you for this opportunity to come out into your house again to worship. I praise you and thank you so much for all that you've done in our lives and in our family's lives. And I just ask you to be with us this week and guide us and direct us and just be with all the people, Father, that, that are on our hearts and our minds tonight, Father, and just help them and just um, touch them in whatever way that they need. And just go with us this week and just help us to be godly examples to all that we come in contact with and keep us safe. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.